Hey, peace of love, peace of love, family. This is Brother Garfield, and again, this is a, a Friday evening. Um, and I normally don't broadcast on Friday evening because Sarnetta is normally on, which he does have a debate right now. I'm not trying to come on the same time as my brother Sarnetta. But um, tonight we got a special guest, um, Dr. Richard Carrier, who's been on here probably three or four times already. We know he's actually the gentleman that's keeping the believers at bay with the whole Jesus exists argument. Boy, if Richard Carrier didn't exist, boy, I tell you, they would have been steamrolled by the entire Christian community. So actually, in between the mythicist position and um, the historicity argument, you have Richard Carrier standing right here. And without him, I'm telling y'all, there's no legs for him to stand on because they pretty much beat up everybody else. But anyway, last year during Black History Month, I had Richard Carrier on. And um, Jabari was offended that I didn't invite him on the show while Dr. Carrier was on so he could defend his stance while we were reviewing some of his information. Now, let me just say this. I really don't care about how people feel about how I run my personal show. This is my platform. All right? Now, watch this. When Jabari says Jesus doesn't exist, his main guy he uses is Dr. Richard Carrier. He loves Dr. Richard Carrier's scholarship. But when it comes to criticizing his scholarship, oh, Dr. Carrier can't do it because he's the Tamahu, the white guy. He can't do that. Not on my channel. Well, anyway, what I'm going to do, family, I'm going to play a little bit of what Jabari said in response to when I had Dr. Carrier on. And, of course, if Jabari is watching because he didn't get to go to his um, his trip and he's he's able to come on tonight. So he can't complain and say, God, if he didn't let him come and defend his stance or whatever. And so let's take a listen for a little bit. Garfield has actually clipped my slides what? from my discussion with you. What? He has actually had someone purchase my DVD. <laughs> Bug. Oh, yeah. By the way, that is not true. Nobody clipped any video. I, I gave him a copy, a video from Sarnetta. Nobody clipped a video. We, somebody bought your DVD, which is Sean. So let's just get the information right, Jabari. Hold on one second, family. Garfield, man. You. This is really funny that uh, he would actually get a PhD level scholar to look at my work, to come on his program, and then to um, to critique me without having me have any ability to respond to the critique. And the funny thing that he was doing is they were critiquing slides. Now, folks, if you know what slides are, slides are not complete thoughts. They're fragments. So for them to critique slides in and of itself was ridiculous. <laughs> Recognize that that's what Garfield did to someone who he calls his brother, by the way. Do you think that I would go get a Western Tom Who scholar to come? Hold up, Jabari. Garfield's trying to call in. Garfield, I'm going to let Jabari right. tell his story hey. first, and then I'm going to let you come to call in. Let me say this to you, Sonetta. Yeah. I have little to say to Garfield. And you know why I have little to say to him? Because when he had a white dude in the middle of Black History Month talking uh -oh. about uh -oh. his brother, and his brother said, I, I, I think I should at least be able to respond to the stuff. He said, I don't want to go back and forth. Well, you already had a back and forth because you had my stuff and you had this dude here. So uh, the fact that he would not let me in means that why should I talk to him on this platform now? That showed really poor character to do that. Mm. He has this 20 for 20, 20 scholars for 20 days. During Black History Month, he's speaking to nothing but white scholars, but Tom Who scholars. What is wrong with Garfield? And then he has the nerve to bring them in to critique someone who he says is his brother without having his brother respond. Now, folks, imagine for a second Yes, your character, Garfield. That was a poor, that's a poor show on your character. It really is. It really is. That's not how you do things. That's not how you do things. Imagine if Sonetta's mother found out that he went to the next door neighbor to get the next door neighbor to come fight with his brother or sister. His mother would whoop Sonetta's butt and say, how are you going to bring someone from outside to fight someone in your family? And that's exactly what Garfield did. 
I guess Garfield went to go get his big brother to fight D Jabari. That's what he did. That's 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 Joe's very uh, poor character. And let me go one further. I'm gonna play a clip of what happened. Not only did that occur, but I think it's really interesting that Richard Carrier he claims to disagree with my methodology. But whenever Garfield would ask him about a specific claim I made, for the most part, he agreed with me. He said we don't have all the input, but this. Okay, um, let me just say, that's Jabari, of course. And um, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to leave that alone for now, all right? And what I'm going to do is introduce to you New Testament scholar, a gentleman who has held the believers and the evangelical Christians at bay with the mythicist, the strongest mythicist argument I've ever seen in my lifetime, and a scholar who has a peer-reviewed work on if did Jesus exist, including methodology and everything. All right? Um, this is Dr. Richard Carrier, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have a, an applaud button, but let me applaud you anyway, because you're holding them Christians off, boy, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, oh, thanks you for having me on. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm exhausted for really reasons unrelated to this. I've been moving a storage unit, so uh, I'm just, oh, I'm tired, got a creaky neck, and I'm just going to drink some wine while we discuss history and methodology it sounds like a great time right, right let me ask you this seeing that what you heard did you watch that video before with jabari have you seen that before no that? i haven't um I, and, and i hope like he goes beyond the ad hominem grievance argument and gets into something actually relevant mm -hmm. right uh, <laughs> so. not really it's about it's about playing to your audience like for example i don't have a problem bringing you on during black history month because technically speaking we are supposedly Americans. So Americans, race is a social construct. That's what he teaches. And that's what we teach in the community. It's a social is a, is a social construct which, we, which needs to be done away with. So yeah, I was race, quite surprised. Your race, him. Your, race, your race doesn't matter when he wants your scholarship or anybody's scholarship for that matter. But it yeah. matters when you're critiquing or looking at his works. Yeah, I, I found that quite offensive, like trying to dismiss my work just because I'm a white scholar. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, that that's neither here nor there. Uh, but I would I would be more interested in getting into like the actual arguments and facts. Like, did we get one of his arguments wrong? Like, right, uh, exactly. did we? I, I that, that's why I want to know. Um, <clears throat> this whole I, I don't think there's any obligation to have people on to point by point immediately respond to a critique. Uh, it totally makes sense to have an interviewee on and then have the the critiqued person come on separately and then respond. Like that's a, a perfectly valid procedure. Uh, there, there's no need to have this sort of like live duke it out with people. Um, and, and I think if you're, if you're going to do scholarship, you should be comfortable with that kind of mode of exchange because that's that's pretty normal in the, in the field. Hey, Jody Breeze, Jabari was invited. He said he would be on a plane to Kemet and that conference has been canceled. So I'm sure somebody's going to run back and say, hey, Garfield is live talking about you. So if he wants to come on... And have a dialogue. We we have two hours, two three hours, if he wants to really get it in with Jabari or with on with Dr. Carrier. Um, you wrote an article, talked about some problems with modern Kemet teachings. I would like to go over some of the points um, that you made. Let me just share the article with the with the family. It's on Richard Carrier's blog, which is um richardcarrier.info. Right? Richard Carrier. That's right, richardcarrier.info. There it is, Martin. yeah. All right, so this was written on February 26, 2021, and this was actually after the interview that we did, right? It was after, yeah, pretty much after the interview. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. problems with modern Kemetic mythology. And um, before I go any further, is there anything you want to you, you think you wanted to add on to this article, seeing that this was a year ago? Uh, no, I mean, uh, the article I went into, if, basically I end with nine rules that people should follow methodologically that, that he violated in constructing uh, his arguments here. Um, <clears throat> the only thing, I mean, I haven't heard any kind of response that relates to actually anything that I pointed out. So I don't have any uh, counter response yet. So I, I have no idea if we got something wrong of what he was claiming or I've no, I don't know what there is to respond to. So uh, hopefully we'll get into that today. All right, cool. 
All right, so let's take a look. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, let me repeat. Jabari was invited to come on. He has the right to come on. There's no excuses this time. He was on a, on a plane to Egypt. The whole conference in Egypt got canceled. So this Friday is open. He's aware of this show in advance. At least two to three weeks in advance, he was aware of this actual show. So no one come in the chat and say, where is Jabari? Where's Jabari? Jabari is invited. <laughs> the link is actually pinned. So anybody can actually press the link, but I, I just want Jabari to press the link. That's what I want. All right? Um, there is a subcategory of neo-paganism today called Kemetism or Egyptian neo-paganism. Mm -hmm. Now, he was offended that you call it Egyptian neo-paganism, which neo, for those who don't know, means new. So there's a yeah. new form of new paganism. I, I, don't, I don't find it offensive, but... And then they said, it is often heavily wrapped up in black supremacists or Afrocentrism movements. Nothing offensive there. By analogy to Wicca, the most well-known variety of neo-paganism, which is based on a European pagan legacy, Kemetic religion is derived from Egyptian religion almost exclusively. Much of neo-paganism is allegorically naturalist and only culturally religious or vaguely spiritual and quasi-supernaturalist. But unlike this major trend in contemporary neo-paganism, Kemetists are not content to just reimagine an Egyptian pantheon culture and ritualism. They also have a chip on their shoulder about deconstructing all modern religion as secretly Egyptian. Who disagrees with that? I, I would love to know. Because remember, they're saying Islam come from Egypt. Yeah, Christianity this is come right. from Egypt, Judaism comes from Egypt. That's exactly... Oh, you did say it in the second sentence. Thus, yeah. in the following sentence. Thus, Christianity and Islam are really just bastardized, stolen versions of Egyptian pagan mythology and thus really African, in particular, of the most historically advanced ancient civilization in Africa, the African master race, as it were. This is where the whole religion goes off the rails. All right, so let's stop right, stop right here for a minute. I addressed some examples of this recently on the Dagger Squad where we critique just the sampling of claim from the most famous comedic apologist today, Brother Jabari. The whole process reminded me of some common fundamental lessons in historical methodology. Okay, so one of the stuff that you um you talked about, you said stop trusting historian before 1950. You have said this before, but why do you say that? Yeah, I mean, it's actually something, one of the first things uh, my advisor at Columbia, my PhD advisor at Columbia University said to me when I sat down and he says, don't trust historians before 1950. And then he like explained why the cutoff date and, and what the exceptions to this rule are and so on. Uh, it's because there was a major shift in methodology between uh, before the 1950 and after 1950. So that uh, history became more professional and methodologically sound after 1950. Before that, it had a lot of defects in the way it operated. Uh, and consequently, almost everything that was concluded back then has been overthrown or, or modified uh, by more reliable methodologies and studies since. So so anything before 19th, and especially the 19th century, like there's just a lot of just really terrible history in the 19th century. Uh, and, <clears throat> and so if you're gonna rely on that kind of stuff, you really, really need to check the most recent scholarship and see like, do those claims hold up or have they been overturned or abandoned? Uh, you just can't cite people from 19th century as if they're authorities. It, it's too obsolete, it's too old. Right. And and this this is what we're actually trained as historians to recognize. This isn't just something I personally came up with. Uh, this is something that if you're going to be trained in this field, you need to know this fact. Which leads to rule number two, always trace a claim to its earliest evidence, which he does pretty much um, explain. Jabari fails at this when he tells us he found proof in the Chronicon Pascal that ancient Egyptians worshipped a version born Horus, who was adored in a manger. He quotes his, his imagined source. Wow. So basically, you're saying this source he's quoting don't even exist at all because it's... Imagined. Yeah, so that, that quote right there that you've shown on the screen, that's from a 19th century, well, basically an amateur. He wasn't even an actual historian who wrote that. It is a complete misrepresentation of what's in the Chronicon, which is the actual source that we're supposed to be looking at. When you go to the Chronicon, you get a different story, uh, but also when you put the Chronicon in context 
you realize it's not even a, an Egyptian source. Uh, it's, it's it's a late medieval Christian European source, uh, and it's making everything up. It's an apologetic uh, myth making that you can't support with any actual Egyptian evidence. And that's the kind of thing that you would find out if you trace it to original source. Like rather than just quote a guy from the 19th century, go to the Chronicon. What does it actually say? And then look at the scholarship on the Chronicon. What document is this? Who wrote this document? For what purpose? Did it use sources? Did it not use sources? Does it make stuff up? Uh, you know, like understand what you're re reading and using in its context so that you can actually use it, you know, effectively. All right. Which leads to rule number three. Once you have found the earliest surviving source, you must date and contextualize and critically evaluate its evidence. Don't just be a gullible dupe and believe anything anyone wrote down. Least of all, the most unreliable of people in the history of history, medieval Christian myth mongers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Understand the context of your sources. Who, who's writing this? What methods did they use? Should you even be trusting them? And when was it written? Uh, th these are the kinds of questions that you, you need to answer and you need to approach this stuff critically, not just, just assume that whatever someone says because you like it, that therefore it's true. Um, in rule number four, you say always check your facts and your logic to make sure your claims actually follow from the evidence that actually exists. Let me, let me say this. Everyone has a specific bias as humans. By human nature, you have a bias. You know, I might like... Um, um, what do you call it? I might like Hershey's chocolate. You might like Nestle's chocolate. You know, when we talk about chocolate. So if I said, well, <coughs> Hershey's is the best chocolate. And you're like, have you had Nestle's? And I'm like, no. And you said, I've had Nestle's. And I'm saying it's the best. So everybody has a bias <laughs> in what they're going after. It's human nature. Right. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. So now, and that's what methodology is for, right? Met methodology is designed for, for you to work around your biases so you can make exactly, sure exactly. that your conclusions hold up. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jabari repeated the insistence that Horus is, is a virgin born God. In the most common myth, his mother Isis fucks her brother Osiris after endowing him with a magical prosthetic penis that inseminates her. Mary does not fuck Yahweh by riding his magical dildo. So in no way is the one borrowed from the other. To the contrary, Mary's insemination by angelic magic is deliberately crafted to renounce such vulgar myths. The whole point of her having an untouched virgin who never fucked a thing is to prove she is the superior of all these tawdry pagan whores because sex is gross, which is a Jewish idea. Wow, I never really, I, when I read the article, I didn't even remember reading this part. Not yeah, and, and the Egyptians were not that anti-sex. They didn't have a problem, hang-ups about sex that that you know, infused the virgin birth story in the Christian chronicles. Yeah, so in Egyptian mythology, had only one virgin mother goddess, Nith, and the only virgin born god is her son, Ra. And Nith is not impregnated by some sub-deity casting a spell on her on behalf of a higher God as Gabriel more or less does to Mary, but by her own direct will to create. Mary does not do that, nor is she a God. Her de facto deification would not occur until the Middle Ages, and though by then some role has to be played. I think what you're basically saying, you, you can't look at both myth one-to-one, -one, meaning that Mary, how Mary got impregnated was by a God, but how... um. Horus, how Horus came to be, in, first of all, is not the same way how Mary was. And then in the, in the instance when there's a virgin mother, it doesn't... Even Ra, happen. yeah, right. Even when we actually have a virgin birth, um, the birth of Ra, it's, they're not similar stories. Although I think it's they come from a similar motif going all around the Mediterranean at this time in the Middle East. So, so they're, they're, they have common sources, but I, I don't think Christians are borrowing the idea from Neith because Mary is not a goddess. And I do notice in that paragraph, I make a note that in the Middle Ages, uh, Christians absolutely started taking Isis with Horus statues and repurposing them and claiming that they were Mary with the baby Jesus statues. That absolutely definitely happened. And they did this with other deities too, other statues in other cultures. They, they took existing uh, statuary and existing uh, religions and reinterpreted it as, oh, this is Jesus, this is Mary and Jesus and so on. Um, but this is all medieval. That stuff happened centuries later. It, it 
is not any part of the origin of the religion, which is what we're supposed to be talking about here is how did the religion begin? Um, when you get to later, you get politi politicized Christianity and it starts borrowing from other cultures for political reasons, for propagandistic reasons. The religion had already been around for centuries by then, so it can't explain the origin of the religion. And it's important to keep these two things distinct. Right, right. Um, let me go down to December 25th is neither Egyptian nor pagan. I, I won't go to the article, but explain it. Because growing up, and when I first started following Kemet, going to the slave theater, seeing Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, seeing Asa Hilliard, seeing all these great gentlemen in the, in the African-American community who are historians who have taught us so much, I always heard about December 25th, especially because of Cursey Grays, which is one of the yes. books, like a Bible. In the conscious community, Cursey Graves, you can't say no. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Cursey Graves is not a black man. I need to emphasize that clearly to everybody. And the fact of the matter is, you guys will respect every scholar if he agrees with you. Everybody loves Dr. Carrier, but don't say nothing about Dr. Jabari. Oh, you can't talk about Jabari, man. Oh, come on. You can't <laughs> criticize him. It's crazy. Yeah. Let's yeah. Talk about this December 25th thing. And, and how it relates to Heru or Horus and um, the other gods that they talk about. Yeah, and so, as I point out in the article, when you go and actually check the sources, this idea of any god being born on the 25th of December had not been invented yet. That that doesn't arise until a century, but actually two centuries after Christianity began. Um, and so Christian, and Christianity also didn't have this. Jesus wasn't born on December 25th either. You won't find that in the New Testament. That's not part of it. Uh, when you look in the second century, the birth dates for Jesus are usually March. They're usually spring, April, things like that. They're usually spring dates, not December. And, and it gets started to move to December in the third century. And the reasoning that you see for it has more to do with this weird uh, numerological argument about Jesus was conceived on the same day that he was born. And so if you add nine months to that, you get, uh, you know, if you, you, you get or subtract nine months or whatever, you get December 25th versus the date of his death, which is based on a Passover, which he can't have died on anyway. So it's, it's all mythology. And all of this is, has to do with numerology and, and in, internal Christian thinking. It doesn't come from borrowing from any other religion. And this actually started before we get the first sun god being born on the December 25th, which is uh, Aurelius Victor put that on the Roman calendar. And it was the first time that happened. And his reason for putting it on the calendar there had more to do with the fact that that was the only slot left open on the Holy Day calendar. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that being a special date. The solstice date, the birth of the sun is the 21st of December. So, so, 20, so it's always mystified me how people confuse the 21st with the 25th. The 21st is the birth of the sun. Uh, although even then, most sun gods aren't literally born on December 25th or 21st, even that. So, and when you look at the Egyptian religion, as I note, uh, the gods are actually born in summer. Um, the, the key gods that we're talking about here, like uh, uh, Osiris and Horus, uh, and I think even Ra. Oh, okay. Let me ask you this. You do point out that um, Jabari not only fails to learn any of this because he facts, fact checks nothing and just gullibly believes whatever some long dead white guys told him. But he garbles even the sources he claims to have. Contrary to what he elaborately claims, the late pagan author Macrobius does not date any holy day to December 25th, least of all the winter solstice, which occurs not on the 25th, but on December 21st. The Saturna, Saturnalia, which he wrote a lot about, is many days long and ends before the 25th. It was most typically celebrated from the 17th to the 23rd. So he uses Saturnalia and Macrobius, and um, he was also wrong about those sources. Am I correct? Yeah, it, it doesn't give us the December 25th date. Um, and and that's and so this is how this, and you hear this on the internet a lot. Uh, you find it in books. Um, I don't know if it's in Cursey Graves specifically. Um, I can't remember. It's been so long since I've even looked at Graves. Uh, <laughs> been like 30 years i think 20 years um before i even bothered looking at that treatise but uh it certainly in the 19th century this myth arose and then people keep repeating it but if you don't go back and check is that myth true where does that come from what sources do we have when you go actually looking for it it dissolves it's it's somehow that idea came up in the 19th century and became sort of regurgitated recycled lore of the modern era but it didn't exist in the ancient world this idea of uh, sun gods or any gods being born on the 25th of december didn't exist then, at least not when Christianity arose, which is, again, we're supposed to be explaining the origins of Christianity. 
it's it's doubly weird because, like I said, Jesus in the original in the origins of Christianity, Jesus isn't born on the twenty fifth of December. So it's it doesn't even even if that <laughs> it's not even relevant to what we're discussing uh, or what we're supposed to be discussing, which is the origins of the religion. Um, you now you can talk about like later medieval co opting of Egyptian and other reli uh, cultural religions. They they borrowed stuff from the Celts. They tried to co-opt Celtic religion. They tried to co-opt Egyptian religion. They tried to co-opt Syrian religion, Roman religion, Greek religion, and so on. Um, when you get to that, you do start seeing these lifts. Um, and it, it would be entirely in fitting with that for them to have borrowed the birthday of some particular fitting God that they thought was appropriate. So that's plausible. But when we look at the actual history of the December 25th date being assigned to Jesus, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with any pagan gods. And the only pagan god it could have anything to do with would have been Sol Invictus, which is a Roman, a Syrian Roman god. So uh, not an Egyptian god. Uh, and uh, so so there's just, when you go looking at the sources, none of these claims hold up. They they all dissolve rather quickly. Well, you brought you brought a hammer right here, or a dagger, because we're on the dagger squad right now. <laughs> and you said that the ancient Egyptians had a calendar and and um, Ra was actually born in August, and Horus was born in what's called the intercalary days or extra days that complete a solar year, which in the Egyptian system were assigned to no month at all and occur, and occur nowhere near December. They fill the calendar in summer. So I never knew this because if that would just eliminate the whole 25th, but, but a lot of this stuff that he's repeating comes from Cursey Graves. It comes from the, um, the right. gentleman, I forgot his name. Um, most of the stuff they get from him when when he talk about the Egyptology stuff. They get a lot of stuff from that guy, the astrotheology stuff. They get it from, um, I forgot what the guy's name is. Um, well, there's Casey, there's Jackson. Um, there's a bunch of these late 19th, early 20th century authors doing this stuff. Uh, oh, but I mentioned someone in my article too uh, that he got that from. David, David Ulanis. You Lancys, the origins of the Mithra ministries are Roger Beck. Well, those guys are not writing about Christianity. They're writing about Mithraism. Um, no, I'm thinking of the, the Chronicon Pascal. That came from someone. Let me check that. Where did I put my thing? I had it open. I've lost it. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> um, yeah, so when that we talked about that earlier where he's claims to be quoting the Chronicon Pascal, but he's actually quoting this 19th century scholar's miswriting of what's in there. Logan Mitchell. Uh, and I notice, yeah, there's a lot of these claims come from people like Logan Mitchell, who's 19th century amateur, who had a lot of these cranky theories about Egypt. Uh, but there were a lot of these guys back then. It, this was kind of like a cottage industry at the time. Mm -mm. Um. Let's talk about the resurrection on the third day. It appears to be based on ancient Near East concepts surrounding death that predate the written record. Our earliest example of the motif is not Egyptian, but Sumerian. It appears in the ancient tale of the death and resurrection of the goddess Inanna, which survives on a clay tablet dating at least to the 18th century BC, which contain a legend that could date as far back as the 40th century BC, the motif appears all over the place after that, from Greece and Rome to Persia and Egypt. In Jewish lore, it appears to have been connected to the time it was thought it took for a corpse to become unrecognizable. Um, but it also coincided with Jewish calendric beliefs regarding the time span of the new or full moon, where we see the same assumptions gov governing the assignment of a three-day motif to the death and resurrection of Osiris in Egyptian myth. Both Osiris and Jesus die on the first day of a full moon and rise on its last full day. But this does not appear to be because the Christians borrowed the idea from our Osiris cult, but simply because both Jesus and Osiris cult set their death and resurrection tales around a local lunar holiday. Because the Jews had already long before fixed the Passover to the rise of the full moon and Jesus was conceived as the new Passover sacrifice. All right. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that actually ex puts it pretty clearly. Um, this, these three-day death and resurrection motifs are all over the Middle East at this time. So, And in fact, we have evidence of them being earlier in other cultures than Egypt. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't also in Egypt. We just don't have any sources saying that it was. Our sources for Egypt, uh, including this detail, come from Plutarch, who's a Greek author writing about Egypt under the Roman Empire. 
we don't have any earlier sources that I know of. Uh, no one's actually been able to produce any for me uh, that talk about the third day motif or even the the lunar death and resurrection of Osiris. We, we find that from Plutarch. Um, <clears throat> so it might have it might have been in Egypt, but it seems to have been all over the Middle East, so we can't trace its origin. Uh, lots of different religions are borrowing this idea. And in this particular case, we know why Jesus is being assigned that particular date. It's because of Jewish reasons, has to do with the Jewish calendar, Jewish scripture, and so on. Uh, so there's no, there's no superfluous need to say that they're borrowing from Egypt. They're using the same reasoning that was used to assign that date to Osiris, because the Egyptians are also using a lunar calendar. They're doing the same kind of uh, lunar magic, lunar holy day reasoning. So they, they're, they're engaging the same kind of thinking that's resulting in the same kind of outcome in terms of their mythology. This doesn't require either one to be borrowing from the other or even to have any knowledge of the other. Um, although it's entirely possible the Christians knew, uh, in fact, I think it's highly likely that they knew about the third day motif in all of these surrounding religions and including the lunar one in, and, uh, in and Osiris. Cario, I think you're one of the best debaters I've ever seen, but I think Jabari I would say he's a better debater than you. But watch this. With all the information that you put out, do you know that Jabari would still beat you in a debate? Uh, through rhetoric and tricks? Is that why you mean? <laughs> <laughs> There's something called the Brooklyn magic, man. You can't get away from the Brooklyn magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, let's talk about it some more. Jabari waxes on a lot about how the star in the infancy narrative of Matthew must be a reference to the dog star Sirius and somehow connected to Orion's belt and thus the pyramids. The Great Pyramids might have some sort of intended stellar alignment, but I can confidently say nothing else he says about this is correct. For one thing, his account seems to garble a bunch of different astronomical facts. He seems to argue that Orion's belt points to the rising of the sun. That's incorrect. It points to the rising of the Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the earth sky, which is nowhere near where the sun ever is. You might know that dog days are when that dog star rises each day at the same time as the sun, which is summer. That coincidence of rising times was anciently used to mark the dawn of the summer season in more places than just Egypt. Egyptians weren't the only ones looking at the sky in antiquity. But more off, the rails is Jabari's attempt to connect any of this to the mythology of Matthew, which I should remind you is only the mythology of Matthew. No star exists in Mark, Luke, or John, and the actual origin of the star motive may be a completely different secret story that I discussed on the history of Jesus. Um, in Matthew, the star is not what we mean in modern English by a star, but what we would today call a UFO, an unidentified flying object that moves and hovers miraculously as suits its divine helmsman. This was never even proposed to be an astronomical phenomenon. Um, what do you call it? Um, all, and all modern attempts to turn it into one are bogus. See astronomer Aaron Adir is the star of Bethlehem. Bethlehem yeah, that, that's a really good book by an actual astronomer on all of the attempts to give an astronomical interpretation of the star of Bethlehem. Uh, so you have a real scientist actually criticizing this stuff and doing a good job of it. Uh, that's the best book I'd say to have to consult on these. It, it, it calls into question a lot of these attempts. All right. All right. So let's move on to, um, oh, and by the way, too, are you saying here, although it says we saw his star in the east as meaning a star in the east. In fact, from context, Matthew must mean the observers were in the east when they first fight. So you're saying in the Greek, it's, it means something totally different. Uh, it can mean either uh, the way it's written. Uh, but in context, it I, I think what they mean is we were in the east and saw the star. Because logically, it doesn't make any sense that they would see the star in the east and then follow it west. That's logically impossible. So so they must have seen it in the west and followed it west because that's what they're saying. Um, and of course, you know, the, the star doesn't just... You know, stars constantly go around the Earth. So you you don't really follow them west. It wouldn't make any sense. Uh, it, it, the Matthew's tale obviously has this as an object that keeps moving around. It's not a star. It's very clearly some object that can float and hover over specific barns. It can disappear and appear at will, and so on. All right. Um, let's move on to the next one. All right. The next one is Jabari tries to argue that Mark's involvement of spit 
in some of the healing miracles of Jesus proves Mark was stealing ideas from Egypt. The reason Egyptian folklore include legends of divine spit, spittle curing wounds. The problem, Jesus never cures any wounds in Mark at all, much less with spit. Scholars and lay folk alike often overlook this, but the gospel Jesus mostly only cures ailments that are commonly psychosomatic and incapable of being proved real. Because that's all that Christian missionaries could actually heal in their tense shows as well. The only wound cure Jesus is credited with appears in Luke, who was so disturbed by both his sources depicting Peter mutilating a slave and Jesus doing nothing about it, and that he decided to invent the tale that Jesus fixed it with fabrication to the story John rejected, and Luke did not imagine Jesus using spit for this. Let me ask you this. What about the blind guy? Didn't he use spit for the blind Correct. guy? Correct. And that's what we get to in the, the next paragraph, talking about he he uses spit to cure the blind and deaf man. Um, and uh, and But that's not an Egyptian thing necessarily. Uh, but even it, it's a common folklore uh, belief. But there there's actually a different reason why it's probably happening in Mark, where he's trying to... Uh, connect the holy water the idea of him as the source of the the water of life um with moses and other related healing miracles and i, I go into that kind of discussion there uh but there the thing is is that the egyptian lore has to do with using spit to cure actual wounds which has scientific basis incidentally um whereas in mark jesus is using spit to cure a blind man uh, of blindness uh, which has no medical scientific basis. Uh, so there's, there isn't, there's the, the analogy is very weak, right? So the comparison is very weak and it gets even weaker when you realize that this idea of the magical power of spit is ubiquitous throughout cultures all around the region. So it's not unique to Egypt anyway. Uh, so there isn't really anything you can do with this, especially since we can give an actual scriptural reason, an actual scriptural logic reason why Mark would come up with this. We, we don't need any recourse to him borrowing it from any particular culture. All right. And you said, please, no more crank etymology. And rule number nine, don't just believe any etymology someone spurts at you. Check real linguistic scholarship first. Crank etymology often operates on the totally bonkers principle that if two words in radically different languages even remotely sound alike, the, that one must have derived from the other. This is as dumb as thinking all the bald men you ever met must come from the same village in Finland. <laughs> so no, contra Jabari, the English word thought does not derive from the Egyptian god Thoth. Thoth is the Greek bastardization of the actual name Jehuti, which derives from an Afro-Asiatic language, which had no significant influence on the Indo-European. Our word thought derives through Germanic thought, most likely long predating any Greek influence as multilinguist cladistics indicated derived from the Proto-Indo-European word tongue thousands of years before Greeks even encountered Egypt, much less Germans. There is simply no connection to Egyptian language, gods, or myth. Likewise, contrary to Jabari's fabricated etymology, the name of Mary is actually the English bastardization of the Greek transliteration Miriam, of the Hebrew name Miriam. The mythically famous name of the sister of Moses. When Christianity arose, one in every four Jewish women had that name. It has no known connection to any Egyptian words or persons. Yeah, because they they like to use Mary, M-E-R-I, and say, you see, yeah. that comes from Mary and, and all that stuff. And then right. this one. No, <laughs> it's not where it comes from. And the city of Paris wasn't named after any African deities either. It derives rather from the name of the Celtic tribe, who originally lived there when it was conquered and colonized by the Romans, the Parisi. In fact, the city's actual full name is Letitia Parisiorum. The word Letitia, deriving from the Celtic word luto for marsh or meadow, in other words, meadow of the Parisi tribe. Wow. Because he says Paris comes from the term Isis. I know. <laughs> no, this is, this, yeah, that's, this, that's frustrating. That, frust that kind of stuff frustrates me. Um, it's easy to fact check these things and know that they're not true. So, so why continue spreading them when you could just check and go, oh, okay, that's not true. I can't use that argument anymore. Um, and, then, and then if you're not doing that, if you're continuously not doing that, that makes you wonder what else he's saying that doesn't check out if you were to fact check it. Uh, so it, it's like Kersey Graves. And this is what I wrote about Kersey Graves about 20 years ago or so is that 
he gets so many things wrong and makes up things so often that you can't trust anything he says. Like, so you could just not even read Kersey Graves. It's a waste of your time because it would be way more work to just fact check everything than to just do all the work over again yourself. Uh, so I, I think Jabari is kind of acting like Kersey Graves in this regard, using invalid methodologies to come to invalid answers and assertions. Um, and if he's doing that so often with these things that I caught, there could be, who knows, dozens, hundreds other claims that he's making that he's also, that are also false, that are also won't check out if you fact check them. All right. Again, so, Jabari, if you're listening, and I know you guys ran back and, and texts and all that stuff the last time. I don't know what happened this time. We, we're ready. We're ready if you want to um, take on. If not, I'll cut the show off in 20 minutes. All right. Um, something I wanted to bring up to you. What would make you believe Jesus is a historical person? What's going to convince Dr. Carrier tonight? Yeah. Stop bringing <laughs> evidence tonight. Dr. Carrier's like, that's it. I'm done. That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I discussed this in Jesus from Outer Space. Uh, I have a chapter on this using many other examples of why why do I believe uh, Spartacus existed? Why do I believe Hannibal existed and Pontius Pilate and uh, Herod Agrippa and so on? Um, there's lots of things we could have had, right? Uh, we could have had letters from Paul that, that are authentic letters, not forgeries, that plainly make clear that, that he understood Jesus to have been a recent guy walking around uh, in Judea or Galilee. Uh, that would be enough, like just basically one sentence. Uh, instead, all we get from Paul are very vague statements that are compatible with multiple different meanings. So we don't have any clear statement. Uh, and I give an example in uh, on the historicity of Jesus right from the start when Tacitus asks Pliny the Younger uh, to tell him, he says, hey, I know your dad died trying to rescue people uh, at the eruption of Vesuvius when the volcano in Italy erupted. And he, he marshaled the Navy to try and rescue people and he was overcome by fumes and killed. And he says, I want to write this in, up in my history books. Can you tell me from your own personal experience um, what, that, what happened that day? What were the events of that day? What do you remember? And so on. And Pliny writes this long letter, this long heartfelt letter about the events of that day and his interactions with his dad and his last fateful meeting with his dad and what, what his dad did and what people who went with his dad and came back reported it happened. And, and so you get all this information, this really great story about the fate of this, basically what I call a scientific hero. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, so we have, you know, an eyewitness detailed account uh, relating other eyewitness accounts uh, of the existence of this person. We could have easily had that kind of stuff for Jesus. Like people would write a letter saying, hey, I want to know more about what you guys you know, what, what was he really like when you saw him in person and things like that? Or uh, like, were you really there when he died or, or, or so on? Like you could have a letter where you have the exact same kind of exchange um, that isn't obviously forged. We have examples of things that are just fake, but um, we can show, for instance, stylistically that the seven, what we call the seven authentic letters of Paul, stylistically and in literary construction and in context and so on, we can show that they're actually, those are probably authentic. If we had a letter that fit them, in style and and discourse style and everything uh and yet had something like this um where paul says you know and i sat down and i talked to the disciples about what jesus was like in life or or about this about what he said on the sermon on the mount or whatever it doesn't matter what it was it could be anything right just one little thing uh well we don't have that um but if we had just one thing like that that would be enough and we have something almost like that which is in first thessalonians 2 um, where there's a digression suddenly, and it talks about the Jews uh, executing Jesus. Now, before I came along, before mythicists came along, scholars had already concluded that those lines are interpolated because they have uh, a lot of statements in them that are completely uncharacteristic and even contradict Paul's own theology and teachings. So it's long been rejected, that, that, that passage. Now, some apologists still try to re rehabilitate and defend that verse, but, but most mainstream scholars think that it's an interpolation. Paul didn't write it as a forgery. But if that weren't the case, uh, if it actually didn't contradict Paul's thinking, if it actually was completely in line with Paul's thinking, if there was no reason to think that it was interpolated, then that passage would be all we would need, frankly, uh, to conclude that more, at least more probably than not, Jesus existed. It's just that we don't have anything like that. Uh, and, and, and what we have actually is looks in the opposite direction, where we have Paul saying outright, the gospel is only known by revelation and scripture. He never mentions Jesus having a ministry or anyone listening to him preach. Uh, when he was alive. So, so we have the opposite, uh, which is what makes it uh, more dubious. But that didn't have to be the case. We, we could have had better evidence. We just don't. Right, right. 
Um, let me ask you this. What are you working on a book right now or any, any new books, any new projects? I'm not working on a book. Um, well, actually, actually, that's not entirely true. Uh, so I, I personally am not working on a book, um, but I have been hired to do a kind of collaboration with Jonathan Sheffield. And Jonathan Sheffield's a Christian apologist for Anglican tradition. Right, right. Uh, and I've had a few online debates with him. That, uh, and I've, I've often said, like, he's the most honest Christian apologist I've interacted with because he, he's actually sincere and he doesn't try to use tricks or rhetoric or doesn't try to game you or anything. Um, uh, no, he, he, like, says it like it is. He he's, he's sincerely believes these things and explains why he believes them. Uh, and so he's actually uh, hired me to do a kind of critique uh, and contribution to a book he's writing where he's going to try and argue for his position. Uh, and it will mostly be like arguing for his position. It's not really going to be a debate between him and me. Uh, but I am going to comment like some of my methodological comments about it and things like that. And so I will be participating uh, in this book. So there will be, you know, small chapters by me in this book. Uh, and, and so it's really his book. Uh, but but that will that's a thing that I'm sort of working on. I haven't gotten started on it, but I'm about to. Um, so that's in the pipe. Uh, there's a book that was published in Italy. Oh, gosh, I think it's been published. If it hasn't, it's going to be soon. Uh, in Italian, uh, unfortunately, um, where it's me, Robert Price, and uh, uh, Fernando Bermejo Rubio, uh, and another scholar, we engage in kind of like a written debate throughout this book about the historicity of Jesus, some of which material I've adapted and, and put in Jesus from Outer Space. But they've told me that uh, if I want to produce an English version of this, uh, that I have a green light to do that. Uh, so I might do that. I've, I've got that also in the pipe, but it's, you know, far down the list of priorities right now. So that theoretically that could exist at some point. Uh, it, it probably still already still exists in, right now in Italy. You could probably find the Italian <laughs> okay. version, but, um, but I'm hoping to do the English version. Okay. We got 15 minutes left. And what I'm going to do is the link is in the chat. If anyone wants to come on and ask Dr. Carrier a question. And That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on in. Don't be scared. Don't be scared of the white guy now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But let me let me say this, though. I, I would really love to see you and Jabari debate. I, and I would be rooting for Jabari because, not because, um, because on those Egyptian things, a lot of us hold to it. But bottom line is not really rooting for him, but rooting for the truth. And I, and I think one of the one of the things about human beings is we can't really say we don't like saying I don't know, and we don't like admitting on the spot that we're wrong. So right. those are yeah. things as human beings we we like it's just within our nature as human beings we don't we hate to say I don't know. Uh, we have to make something up on the spot. Or right, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm wrong, man. I'm sorry. I'm I'm wrong. I, I, you know <laughs> what? I'm not I'm not capable of answering. You know, you have to act like you're just the, the guy that knows everything in the world. The top um physicists and scientists that know every answer possible on the planet what happened when it happened who it happened with and so forth but well, um, you, know, I'll, I'll, you and jabari debate this this stuff i think this pseudo this this pseudo information has been going on for over years upon years in this country well over a hundred right over a hundred years yeah the last 50 years, the African-American community has the swallowed this information and they say, hey, it's That's right true. and exact. Well, what I would like to see, I, I haven't checked, like I haven't looked to see, um, but there's got to be like today, like actual PhDs in Egyptology who are people of color. And it would be interesting to like find some of them and see if any of them would, would be willing to come on and discuss this stuff. Uh, so that would eliminate the sort of ad hominem dismissal. Oh, it's coming from white guy. Um, but it, it would be coming from someone with an actual PhD in the field. So uh, I, I'm fairly confident that they'll corroborate what I've been saying uh, and might even be able to give you even more interesting insight uh, into uh, ancient Egyptian culture because that's what they study specifically. Uh, so, and, and so I, you know, I would encourage people to like find someone who's actually fits this description and see if you can convince them to come on the show and, and just have a chat for an hour about these things. Um, I, I think that would be really cool to see uh, and would be more difficult for Jabari to dismiss. All right. Does anybody want to jump on? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go, family. Nobody want to talk to Dr. Carrier. <laughs> Hit the link, man. Don't be scared, man. And since no one else is coming in, it can be on any topic, right? So... Yeah, it don't necessarily have to be about Jesus or even what we just spoke about. It could be anything. Yeah. 
we got to talk about, you want to talk about, you do have a course that you teach on methodology, right? From your, your website. Right? Yeah. Uh, hi historical methods for everyone. Uh, I do that every month and amongst, I have 10 courses that I teach. I teach any of them any month. Uh, and so if you go to my website, there's a link at the top for taking classes and you can look into that and see, and it, it's, it's more of a, I mean, it's basically a month opportunity to ask me all the questions you ever had and get detailed answers. Uh, but there's also, there's assigned readings, there's challenge questions and things like that. So uh, that, that get you into learning these methodologies and, and how to apply them. And in fact, I actually now use this article on uh, chemitism and methodology as a part of that course. It's one of the readings now that I use when because it, it goes into teach? these details. When do you teach the course? Every month. So it starts the first of any month. Uh, if you're going to register, you should register before that. So I know to get you in uh, on the first. Uh, and it's in Google time, Groups. What time is um, the classes? No. So it's, it's not scheduled events. So it's all uh, Google Groups. So it's bulletin board, uh, asynchronous. So it's at your own, at whenever you want, at your own time. Uh, you put as much or as little time into it as you want. You can get to it whenever you want. Uh, so there's no like live lectures or anything like that. It's all assigned readings, occasionally a video. Um, and, and like I said, like there's challenge questions each week. And then, but the main benefit is that you, you, you've, you're in a forum where you've got me as a teacher and you can just, just plug me with all the questions that you ever had on the subject. Uh, and, and especially as more questions arise as you do the readings and challenge questions. Oh, okay. All right. So hold on one second. Somebody say I'm ignoring the super chats. Hold on one second. I'm sorry if I am. <laughs> um, Hold on a second, because uh, I mean, you guys know I don't really care about the funds. I, I mean, think. super chats I thought would show up, wouldn't they? They would pop yeah. up on screen. I think you know what? Some super chats did pop up, but I actually didn't catch it. Oh, yeah, I missed them. Uh, Diliano, Diliano, what's up, my brother? How are you? What's on your mind? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, beloved. <laughs> <laughs> He's so excited, man. He sees the white man <laughs> on my channel. He's excited. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry about that. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah. Oh, excellent. I am a major fan of your work and Garfield. Stop lying, stop lying. I actually do. Right, let's I, team up and beat up Richard Carr right now. <laughs> Come on, man. Let's beat him up, man. I, I can't. I, I don't want to beat him up. I, I'm actually a massive fan of Jabari, too. So, one, I am a longtime watcher of both Far your yeah. works and my works as well. I was excited to see you on the show today. I um, wanted to ask a couple of questions because I know that um, with some of your rules, you were talking about the correlation between words and names, especially, um, I, I can't remember because it's kind of on the spot, but mm -hmm. um, I know you had brought up the idea about Mari um, and Mary, not yeah. Miriam, yeah. Miriam, yeah. Miriam. And um, I was actually com um, connecting that back to um, the Egyptian deity in which um, Mari was one of the gods' mother. And I think in, in some of the lectures in the past, I've, I was able to um, make the distinction or kind of like see there was a correlation, but you know, correlation isn't, like you said, like a uh, causing- Right, yeah, yeah. Um, is is there a connection between the, the, the deities of old and how they relate to, um, Christian mythology and, and the mythology of, of the comedic religion, is there that connection there at all? Are you eliminating all connections from what is Christian and so, what is comedic? Right. It, it, so this, this, it's the complex questions because it depends. Like, as I mentioned earlier, when you get to later Christianity, certainly when it's a political religion and it's, it's a religion of empire, um, now you see a bunch of like emulations, right? And so that's when you start seeing the, the um, uh, Isis with Horus statues, they just start calling it Mary with Jesus statues, right? That's it's the actual pagan statue, but they just relabel it. Uh, and so I think they, they do this with Celtic religions and things like that too. So definitely that happens later, but if we're going to try and explain the origin of the religion, so for instance, the name Miriam in the gospels, right? Cause that's where it first appears. Uh, if you're going to explain that, we already know the reason for that is it goes back to the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. So it, it, that's the origin of it. So there's no need to go looking for uh, an Egyptian goddess who, or whether, I, I actually don't know the story of Mary or Mari. Uh, so I, I can't really go into what the connections might be because um, I'm not contesting whether that existed, whether that was an actual part of Egyptian mythology. 
it's just a superfluous explanation because we can't tie it in, right? We can't show that it's probably that's where the Gospels are getting the idea. It looks much more obviously that they're getting it from the Old Testament. Uh, so that we don't need the excess explanation of getting it from Egyptian religion. So, and you could have like to these two parallel traditions where you have similar sounding uh, mother's names. Um, and, and there's the other question of whether they are similar sounding because which which Egyptian tongue are we talking about and what actually, how is it pronounced? That's a whole other thing that I don't get into myself. Uh, I can talk about the Greek, but I don't know uh, the Hieratic or the other, or, or even uh, the later language of Coptic, Demonic, for instance. Right. Hold on one second. Um, hey, um, due diligence, you're on. You're live. You want to ask Dr. Carrier a question? Um, I just uh -huh. I, think, I think it would be a really good debate between him and Jabari. I think Jabari, Jabari is going to run from that debate. I don't really think he really wants that smoke because he's been. Right, don't, worry, don't worry about that. You got a question for Dr. Carrier? We want to beat up Dr. Carrier tonight. Now. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily have no question. You said we could talk about anything. I was going to. All right, all right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Go ahead. Boy. Well, yeah. well, I feel like you've been having some pivotal shows here lately, and I really appreciate the geneticist that you brought on and the, the author. Um, yes, sir. I, I actually watched, watched it sink into your head, Garfield, about these constructs. We've been holding so dear to these constructs, and finally I see it sinking in your head, and I'm just so happy that we can get past these circular conversations thank you man I, I feel, <laughs> just bring it with you bro stay right there because you right you right on it right now talk holding dear to these concepts these african and then try to apply it to science it don't it don't work you know what i'm saying genetics and all of that you can't apply genetics to these to these constructs and think it's going to hold dear to science you know what I'm saying? These are ge geopolitical terms. You know what I'm saying? Then Jews mm -hmm. as a as an identity group, this religious identity, it doesn't mean that it's not race. It's not absolute. It's not no science to it. So whenever you're dealing with genetic markers, it has no bearing. But we put this stuff in there. It's our own biases. We still have belief. And it's in these terms and they're holding us hostage in these constructs. That's the last milestone right there. And I just want to say, I appreciate you. And we need to hold on right there. Thank you. Right. Garfield. I, Thank that you sounds Garfield. like a reference to another show. Do you, do you know the title of that? Can you, Brother Garfield, can you like? One, one um, he's talking about, I had a um, Razib Khan. He's one of the leading archa um, um, yeah. geneticists Genetics in the world. He yeah, yeah. Um, I'm familiar. Well. Yeah, that, that's really that's cool. Crazy. Right on. Think, yeah. So he came on and um, I had a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bruce Haynes from, he's in California with you, um, Dr. Carrier. So he, um, over that side, I should say, West Coast. So he yeah. came on yesterday, he wrote a book called The Soul of Judaism, talking about Judaism from an um, the African descent, you know, modern black Judaism and African descent of it and all that stuff. But he wrote mm. a history of Judaism from a black perspective, from a sociologist perspective, how we got to be Jews, Right. Oh, okay. Could I, yeah. could I? Would I be able to interject just one? Um, oh, no, you can't. Ah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I was gonna say. Um, I think in some cases, I, I can, I, I, I believe in the toxicity of some of these traditions, but there's also an important mythological factor. I think Jabari actually emphasizes in a lot of his lectures about the mm -hmm. power of mythos, and and I don't believe the myth in this particular context is actually trying to take the place of science. And, and I believe that only when Christianity, in a lot of cases, uh, tries to purport itself as a historical book or a scientific book, for that matter. That right. Deleon, 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 yeah. you know what you're doing right now? You're letting Dr. Carrier off the hook. We got to beat him up before you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to beat him up now. Hold on. Let me beat him up. Let me help there's you. actually a super chat. There's an interesting super are chat. You, are you know. telling me, Dr. Carrier, that nothing from Kemet Absolutely nothing from Kemet influenced Christianity. Come on, man. I don't believe that. I'm <laughs> the with the, the origins right. of Christianity now. So if we're just limiting to just the origination of the religion, um, I don't think there was any, I think they're actually there. I mentioned on our show when you and I were on last time talking about uh, Jabari. And I think in the clip that you started this show with, uh, Jabari says, well, Carrier actually agreed with me on it most of the time. I don't know if it was most of the time, but I did actually agree with him sometimes um, that there are things where you can say that there could have been influence or at least some sort of um, uh, 
similar uh, style of construction. And the example I gave um, is the the entire, well, even from the mythicist perspective, the entire model of how Osiris, so Plutarch writes the story about how Osiris being a pharaoh and being on earth and having an earth history and stuff, he says, well, that's all myth, which we actually know because we actually have a continuous record of uh, Egyptian rulers, and we know Osiris was never one of them. So, um, and he says, but the the secret story, the story that was told to insiders, is that Osiris descends just below the moon and is killed by the equivalent Set, the equivalent of uh, Satan in the Egyptian religion at the time, and then uh, th three days later rises to glory and ascends to heaven, etc. Um, which is the mythicist model. It's the Doherty model uh, of the origins of Christianity without a historical Jesus. So if you look at that, it's, you have a clear precedent. And Egyptian, Egypt is right next to Judea, and you have a major Jewish community in Alexandria, and you have pilgrimages between them. So they definitely would know these concepts. Uh, and so when you see that, you can say, like, well, it, it's entirely possible that they borrowed this model uh, of, of how to understand the Christ, their own understanding of the Christ soteriology and the theology of how Jesus... Uh, accomplished his cosmic gift for humanity. So yeah, I do think it's entirely possible to have Egyptian influence. We just need to have like good examples that that show it. And sometimes the most we can get is it's a possibility. It fits, and we can't rule it out. Uh, but trying to but they, this what I run into like the the article that I wrote that you brought up on the screen are going too far. They're making claims that we can actually show are actually false. And if you could just get rid of all the those claims and just stick to the ones that are plausible that you actually that don't fall apart when you examine them, um, I think you would get a much more interesting result. And and yes, you, I think you would end up with a list of things that are possible lists from Egyptian religion and the origins of Christianity. It would be a small list, uh, and it wouldn't be the list that you'd want, um, but it, it, it would not be empty. I think. Uh, so, so yeah. To, um, Ali Hameen, you gave two dollars earlier. Doctor Carrier is Jabari knowledge pseudo. Um, well, I, I can't speak to all of Jabari's knowledge, right? I've I've only examined this one aspect and, and these particular claims. And as I mentioned, like uh, some things he says, I think are correct, right? So, uh, so I think you know he he has some correct ideas and some, but he also has some incorrect ideas and and information. And so I would say you need to fact because of this frequency of unreliable statements, you do need to fact check everything. And I don't think that you're going to find everything he says is false, uh, but you just can't trust it implicitly because he has a high error rate. Uh, so I would say like, just, just fact check everything before, before believing it. Look, do the, use the methods that I got, argue are the methods you should use, like how to trace sources, go to the original, the earliest part of the evidence, um, follow those nine rules that I, that I put in that article and to test every one of his claims or the ones that you care about. Uh, cause you can apply those same rules yourself and get to the truth yourself. You don't even need me, uh, or other scholars, uh, necessarily to do that. Right. Um, there was another super chat. Someone had asked about the Plutarch, myth. Yeah. Why did uh, call Osiris Logos and G and Jury Jesuris? I don't know if that's correct. Well, Logos is, comes from Greek philosophy and the Logos concept had already entered Judaism through Hellenistic influence on Judaism. Uh, you see it in Philo, uh, Philo of Alexandria. So an Egyptian Jew, uh, or at least a Jew in Egypt uh, in the first century, who's writing before Christianity. Um, he talks about the logos concept. The logos means in Greek, it's it means word, argument, reason. It, it has a, a wide valence, um, but it got applied to this sort of angel of many names, this archangel of many names. And it was, you see it in Stoicism, the idea of the Logos as the central organizing principle, that God is pure reason and how he controls the universe through the Logos as sort of the mediary uh, power. And so you get that in Judaism as well. The Logos is, becomes a sort of archangel that mediates God's power in constructing the world, for example, or governing the world as, as well. Uh, and then that gets imported into Christianity from there. But it, you see it in uh, Plutarch says, you know, Osiris is the Logos. So you've got the the same idea infiltrates into Egyptian religion at the time. Uh, but I, I think it was just spreading everywhere. It was this idea that was a very resonant and, and useful idea um, that you see being imported onto these different religions. But it, come, it originates from Christianity, or sorry, originates from Greek philosophy uh, and may may have connections to Persia. It might go back to Zoroastrianism through uh, ancient Persian religion. We can't prove that though. Um, it's just that we see a lot of similarities. Uh, Stoic religion, where this is Stoic theology is where we see the Logos concept. Stoic theology also has a lot of Zoroastrian concepts in it, like the purgatory. 
Tony Schuster, you can't ask no question until you call me here, man. Get out of here with that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Go ahead, man. Ask your question. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, man. I uh, just want to say hi to you, brother Carfield, and this time, and Richard, Richard as well. I've hey, been seeing hi. you um, debating some of the Christian apologists as well. And he lost so, everyone. He lost every one of those debates. Oh, well, they have no answers to him. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask because um, if Jesus is not a historical figure, then then Paul's writings has to be thrown away. But we we know that the Paul's writing is from his hand. You know, he, he was written by him. And he's who who is writings? Paul, uh, Paul, 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 Paul. Paul. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Well, well actually, it, it's interesting. I I, I often point this out. You, you actually could have sincere Christian belief without a historical Jesus because on on what I'm on my theory of how the religion began that's what was the case in when Paul's writing Paul is imagining he understands Jesus as a celestial being who communicates to him in his mind or in dreams or through his heart and so on um so you, you know logically it's logically possible that that's even true right that Jesus actually you know teaches a metaphor and stuff through uh, through revelation. And so everything Paul says could actually be true without having a historical Jesus. Now I'm, I'm an atheist and a naturalist. I think that's highly improbable. I don't think that's the case, but you can make a coherent argument for it. Uh, Did you come another question? Sorry, brother Carthew. Um, oh, you got to pay for that one. You got to pay for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Yeah, um, there's a writings. There's, there's a few writings in the Talmud as well in the Jewish Talmud. And they're talking about uh, Yushka. Um, father was um, Jesus was fathered by a, a Roman soldier. So Pantera, Pantera. Uh, yeah, that was a super chat earlier. I was hoping we'd get back to that. Um, mm. I can't remember if that's in the Talmud. It might be in the Talmud, but it appears it's much in, earlier. It's in the Talmud. I just watched it last night, and then could uh, be, one um, of the Celsus writing. writing. Celsus. Yes, yes. But I think it, it might also be in the Talmud, or at least one yeah, of the Talmuds. It, it, it was um, um, the, the, the rabbi was explaining last night. And they, they, that's why the confrontation between Christianity and yeah, now now it's coming back Jewish to me. Thing. Yes, yeah. mm. yes, it, we do find it in one of the Talmuds, and uh, which I believe is the, the Babylonian Talmud. Babylonian. Um, yes, but we Babylonian also see it, it when Origen is responding to it because Celsus knew this, the pagan critic of Christianity, Celsus, and this is the second century. So, so then the Talmud's yes, like fourth or the, fifth yeah, century, yes. right? So we know that. So that's a good example of a of a polemic against Christians that goes back, and we have multiple corroborating sources centuries apart. So we, we can see that this is an actual a robust claim. Now, I think it's a joke, right? Uh, it's literally uh, people are making fun of Christians, and it's a joke in the Greek. So because uh, the Christians are going around claiming that Mary is a virgin, Parthenos. Uh, and someone told the story that uh, that no 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 she was just stooped by a Roman soldier named Pantheros. Right, just a couple right. letters different. And Panther was a common kind of nickname for Roman soldiers who thought they were all badass. So I'm Panther, right? Uh, and so it was actually kind of so it was kind of a joke on Romans as well. Like oh you know how how arrogant are you to call yourself Panther? That's really lame. Um, but it was it was a common nickname. And so so to to use that play on the words, it's like no no no. It's really it was. Her, her lover was Pantheros, the Roman soldier. I, I think it's it's a joke, right? That, that's Jewish critics of Christians are making fun of Christians with this joke, but it became serious, like like a serious polemic. And the weirdest kind of perverted thing that happened is that it actually became canon in the Nazi version of Christianity, uh, positive Christianity, which is developed by the Nazis as their own sect of Christianity. They seized on that and said it was actually true and therefore, Jesus is an Aryan, and then all the stuff happening in the Gospels is an Aryan sticking it to the Jews, right? So they, they completely twist it around by actually taking this Jewish joke about Christians and turning it into history. <laughs> just, just shows you how, how weirdly people can end up in the strange place, uh, all from well, someone I, punning. I thought Martin Luther did a lot, but there you go. All right, yeah. cool. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut the show right there. All right. Um, hey, hey, Dr. Carrier. Listen, man, I'm going to, um, for those who are interested in learning about methodology, he has a nice course um, at the beginning of every month. Y'all could check it out, sign up, and um, get it going, man, and, and, and learn methodology. I think we lack it a lot. 
um, with that basic methodology. Delano, do you have your own YouTube channel? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I'm just here just looking at you guys. <laughs> I was going to say, you should. You've got good equipment, right? <laughs> Brooklyn Magic Boys. Oh, oh man. man. Why don't oh. you start a cult, man? You Good start. equipment, photogenic, <laughs> you uh, charismatic. You got, a you, you got all the that. Man. Come on, man. Let's start a cult. All the components, right? Oh, one day, <laughs> one day I'm going to take after you guys. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, Dr. Carrier, thank you for your presence. Thanks for teaching. We appreciate you. And I've never looked at you because of the color of your skin, by the way. I've always yeah. loved your information. You made me grow. And I used you for years in, in a lot of my arguments and also with me, as far as methodology. And, yeah, and thank I you, thank you for having me on. I, I appreciate it. Man. My job in life is to prove to you Jesus existed. That's my job. Oh, <laughs> before I forget, you did say in the last interview that there was a, um, a specific find that hasn't been verified, I think, in the 70s A.D. That you said you that mean the library. There's a library that we right. haven't dug. Uh, oh. Yeah, the Library of Herculaneum. It's still sitting under ash. Okay. Uh, it's it's a large rich man's library sitting there. We we dug up a little bit of it and then reburied it uh, because Italy's economy has been hosed since forever, uh, so they couldn't afford to go in. Um, and and the the scrolls are charred, right? So it's hard to reconstruct. But now we have advanced tech. We can we don't even have to unroll the scrolls. We can actually see through them with uh, ac computerized axial tomography. We can actually do. Uh, we can look inside them with x-rays and so on. So, uh, or even particle accelerators as we did with the Archimedes Codex. So uh, this is the thing that, that library is there. We know it's there. It just, mm. no one has funded going back in and it, it's, it dates to 70 AD. That's when the, uh, or 69, which is when the uh, Vesuvius erupted and buried it. Uh, so, so it's there. There's a whole ancient library. Um, and, and it would be seem nice to see someone like, Jeff Bezos or somebody like throw some billion dollars at it and go dig it up right, right. and recover it. Right. Like I, I want, I really want to see this happen, but uh, there's some hints. I see like occasional news story that they're aware that this is a thing, uh, but I would love to see it done. That There could be interesting revelations in there. All right. Thank you, man. Thanks everybody. I'm going to kick everybody off. Dr. Kara, we'll talk later on That's tonight right. or probably yep. um, tomorrow. All debate right. Jabari, debate Jabari. <laughs> I had to throw that out there. I had to throw it out there. Sure, Garfield's yeah. gonna go on Sunday and he's gonna complain again. Oh, Garfield! <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to debate him. I just have to say, if we're gonna do a live debate, when he uses rhetoric, I'm gonna call it out. Right? Yeah. I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna point out the fallacy you used just there, the trick technique you used just there. Like, so he's got to come with an honest game. He, he can't use rhetoric when he does that. If he's gonna All use right. that debate. Thank you, man, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Peace and love. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, just to let y'all know, give y'all an update on what we have coming up next week. We have on the 22nd, Nefernity. She's going to address some of the claims also of the um, why, who I call the Egyptomaniacs about Amen coming from Amen Ra. Um, on the 23rd, we got Dr. Mayat at 12 noon. She's going to talk about the history of mathematics. On, um, let me see, on the next week, Thursday, I have Ihav Ever, who is a descendant of Sephardic Jews. He lives actually in Israel today. And on the 25th, I have my brother Asar Imhotep next Friday at around 12 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to have my brother on live. And then on the 27th, I'll have Chuck Morgan talking about the connection between Kush and Sumeria. Sumer. All right, we're going to talk about that. All right, for now... Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think I'm heading over to Brother Berin's channel. Um, he just texted me um, just not too long. So I'm going to head over there. Peace and love. Share the show. Like the show. Much love and respect. Peace.